Since the 1970s, about 4% of death row inmates have been wrongfully executed, equating to about 190 confirmed cases. Although the case of Thomas Thompson has not been officially exonerated, there is damning evidence to show he should not have been put to death. Welcome to The Last Supper. Hello and welcome to episode four of The Last Supper, a true crime podcast. My name is Colson Davis and I am an amateur chef, a true crime junkie, a music and video producer, and a content creator. Every other week on this podcast, I will be telling you a true death penalty case story and at the same time, I will be cooking that criminal's last requested meal before they were executed. This week, we're looking at Thomas Martin Thompson, whose last meal consisted of Alaskan king crab with melted butter, Mandarin style spare ribs, a spinach salad, Salad, pork fried rice, a hot fudge sundae, and a six pack of Coca-Cola. Now hold up, isn't that super weird? We've had John Wayne Gacy, John Martin Scripps, and then Thomas Martin Thompson. I guess the Johns and Martins out there must be some bad folk. Who knows? You can find all the recipes for the last meals at lastsupperpodcast.com slash blog. Now, real quick, I just want to shout out the Country Butcher of Clearfield in Woodland, Pennsylvania. The Country Butcher has the highest quality meats along with beef jerky, beef sticks, cheeses, spices, all kinds of amazing things down there. For this episode, I went there and got some country style ribs, which look absolutely amazing. I can't wait to try them. I also got these nice looking lemon pepper and Cajun spices that we're going to put on the crab legs there. Go check out The Country Butcher. They are absolutely amazing. Now, let's dive into the case of Tommy Thompson. On September 14th, 1981, two farm workers working in a rural area in Orange County, California, discovered a shallow grave. Police arrived and found the deceased body of a young woman wrapped in a sleeping bag and a pink blanket, all bound together with rope. The body later being identified as a Ginger Lorraine Fleishy, a 20-year-old woman who has been missing for three days. It appeared to investigators she had been raped and stabbed five times in and around one of her ears. The blade reached a length of a two-inch insertion which severed her carotid artery in the side of her head, later determined to be the cause of her death. Her shirt and bra were cut at the front and pulled down to her elbows to fully reveal her breasts. She had no underwear, socks, or shoes on either. Her jeans were potentially pulled back onto her with the zipper all the way up but not buttoned. These were all signs of a possible sexual assault. A vaginal swab was taken and semen was present. Her head was wrapped in two towels, a bed sheet, and her jacket, and was secured with duct tape. She had cuts on her wrist and ankles, along with some ligature marks, appearing to investigators she was handcuffed or bound before her death. Investigators quickly found Thomas Thompson and David Leach to be prime suspects for the murder and sexual assault. Thomas Martin Thompson, also known as Tommy Thompson, was born on March 20th, 1955 in Chicago, Illinois. When Tommy was five years old, his parents divorced and he and his sister moved to New York City with their mother, eventually moving again to Orange County, California. Tommy attended Villa Park High School until his senior year before he decided to move back to Chicago with his father. He moved on to join the United States Army. He was a great soldier who was given three promotions and four letters of accommodation, later being honorably discharged for an unknown reason. After this, he moved back to California to get a higher education at California State University at Fullerton and Santa Ana College on the GI Bill. While there, he acquired 67 credits and an overall B average. He went on to acquire many responsible jobs. His first major job was being the photographer for the Santa Ana Fire Department in September in 1978. Everyone said he had a good attitude and he got recommended for a merit step increase, which is a pay raise for classified employees. He resigned in February of 1980 and took a job as a material supervisor for Floral Engineers Inc. in Saudi Arabia, but eventually getting let go because of a staff reduction. Tommy supported himself with odd jobs while he moved back to California. In his working years, Tommy had many girlfriends. Two of them testified later to his kindness and good heart, adding that Tommy had never been abusive or violent towards them. 
On September 11th, 1981, Thomas Thompson, David Leach, Ginger Fleishy, and Tracy Leach were all hanging out together. Now, here's some background and connections. Tommy and David were roommates in the same one-room apartment. Tommy was not connected to anyone else except David. However, Tommy told the group that his name was Thomas Michael Young, which was suspicious. Now, David was previously married to Tracy Leach and had relations with Ginger after the divorce, and at the time, she was David's ex-girlfriend. They lived with each other for a while as well. Ginger and Tracy were also roommates in another apartment as well, so <laughs> I'm not really sure why these bunch of people were hanging out together, but they were. So Tracy suggested they all go to a pizza parlor, which they ended up doing. After leaving the pizza parlor, David decided to head back to their apartment. Tracy then drove Thomas and Ginger to a local bar and dropped them off. And there they met a man named Afshin Kashani. This was around 9.30 p.m. They all shared conversations and Tommy eventually invited Ginger and Afshin back to his apartment to share with David. Around 1 a.m., the three walked back to Thomas's apartment in Laguna Beach, California. Thomas and Afshin then smoked some hash, which is a very concentrated and pressed version of cannabis. At some point, Ginger decided she wanted to go buy a soda at a liquor store by the apartment. She left and Tommy told Afshin that he wanted to be alone with Ginger. Afshin left and when Ginger returned, Thomas allegedly raped and murdered her before disposing of her body. Now, something to add, when Afshin left the apartment, he realized he left his cigarettes at the apartment and returned to get them. When he knocked on the door, Afshin testified that Thomas answered and appeared nervous and handed the cigarettes out the crack in the door. Now, this was used against Thomas later in trial, which I think is one of the many stupid things the prosecutor brings up. Now, Afshin probably realized pretty quickly that he forgot his cigarettes and would have probably returned within a minute or two. And within those couple minutes, would Tommy really have enough time to fully rape and murder Ginger and her be completely dead without Afshin hearing anything? He also left before Ginger returned to the apartment, so how long was Ginger still gone? My thoughts are that maybe Thomas and Ginger had sexual tension all night and when she got back, they got naked and that's why Thomas didn't want to open the door. These are just my personal thoughts, but we'll get into some theories here. Ginger's body was found buried in a field 10 miles away from David and Tommy's apartment. Tommy did not have any means of transportation at this point in time either. Now, these next points were used against Tommy, but remember this was Tommy and David's apartment they shared. So, all the materials found around her body were from their apartment. There was also some blood found in the apartment six feet from Tommy's bed. The fibers from the pink blanket Ginger was wrapped in matched fibers inside of David's trunk. Also, a footprint that matched David's was also found near where Ginger was dumped. After Ginger's murder, David and Tommy both fled to Mexico. David returned to the States and was arrested. Mexico then told the group that his name was Thomas Michael Young, which was suspicious. Now, David was previously married to Tracy Leach and had relations with Ginger after the divorce, and at the time, she was David's ex-girlfriend. They lived with each other for a while as well. Ginger and Tracy were also roommates in another apartment as well, so <laughs> I'm not really sure why these bunch of people were hanging out together, but they were. So Tracy suggested they all go to a pizza parlor, which they ended up doing. After leaving the pizza parlor, David decided to head back to their apartment. Tracy then drove Thomas and Ginger to a local bar and dropped them off. And there they met a man named Afshin Kashani. This was around 9.30 p.m. They all shared conversations and Tommy eventually invited Ginger and Afshin back to his apartment to share with David. Around 1 a.m., the three walked back to Thomas's apartment in Laguna Beach, California. Thomas and Afshin then smoked some hash, which is a very concentrated and pressed version of cannabis. At some point, Ginger decided she wanted to go buy a soda at a liquor store by the apartment. She left and Tommy told Afshin that he wanted to be alone with Ginger. Afshin left and when Ginger returned, Thomas allegedly raped and murdered her before disposing of her body. Now, something to add, when Afshin left the apartment, he realized he left his cigarettes at the apartment and returned to get them. When he knocked on the door, Afshin testified that Thomas answered and appeared nervous and handed the cigarettes out the crack in the door. Now, this was used against Thomas later in trial, which I think is one of the many stupid things the prosecutor brings up. Now, 
Afshin probably realized pretty quickly that he forgot his cigarettes and would have probably returned within a minute or two. And within those couple minutes, would Tommy really have enough time to fully rape and murder Ginger and her be completely dead without Afshin hearing anything? He also left before Ginger returned to the apartment, so how long was Ginger still gone? My thoughts are that maybe Thomas and Ginger had sexual tension all night and when she got back, they got naked and that's why Thomas didn't want to open the door. These are just my personal thoughts, but we'll get into some theories here. Ginger's body was found buried in a field 10 miles away from David and Tommy's apartment. Tommy did not have any means of transportation at this point in time either. Now, these next points were used against Tommy, but remember this was Tommy and David's apartment they shared. So, all the materials found around her body were from their apartment. There was also some blood found in the apartment six feet from Tommy's bed. The fibers from the pink blanket Ginger was wrapped in matched fibers inside of David's trunk. Also, a footprint that matched David's was also found near where Ginger was dumped. After Ginger's murder, David and Tommy both fled to Mexico. David returned to the States and was arrested. Mexico then tracked down Tommy and returned him back to the States as well. Tommy told police he and Ginger had consensual sex that night and then he fell asleep. He then said he woke up in the morning and Ginger was gone and found her blood near his bed. Both men were charged with the murder and Tommy was charged with the rape. Both men were given separate trials and the prosecution does some pretty shady shit that we're about to get into, but we're going to start with David's trial. Now, note this, that David's trial happened after Tommy was already convicted and sentenced, but we're going to start with him. The prosecutor said that Ginger had been threatened by David in the past, which was reported to the police, and he had a history of criminal violence before this. At the dump site, there was his footprints and fibers matching his car to the dump site as well. The sleeping bag, blanket, and rope were all David's. Ginger was also stabbed five times in the ear with David's fishing knife, which he lied to the police about owning. Now, the police found this knife in the apartment and then disregarded it, and then it mysteriously disappeared. There's a theory that David potentially disposed of the knife in the ocean or somewhere else after they discovered this. The prosecution also called a set of jailhouse witnesses to testify against David. They said that that Ginger was preventing him from reuniting with his former wife, Tracy, and that David had the motive and the violent disposition for the murder. Here are some different quotes from the prosecution. Quote, So we ask ourselves, why would Mr. Thompson murder Miss Fleishy alone in an apartment where he lived with no transportation, no means to move the body, and wait for Mr. Leach to come home to be an A1 witness to the murder of his ex-girlfriend? Is that reasonable or logical? Do you think that's what happened? Quote, who has motive? Mr. Leach. And this was the only motive or reason for her demise. It's really the only motive we have in this case, and people have killed for less. Quote, all the evidence we have incriminates Mr. Leach, at best equally and more so than Mr. Thompson. Quote, you think Mr. Thompson did all this by himself and waiting for this good guy to come home so he could see him standing over his dead ex-girlfriend? No. It didn't happen that way. David was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison in 1985 for his role in murdering and disposing of Ginger. The deputy district court attorney had a theory and is as follows. He thinks that David wanted Ginger murdered for some reason and had Tommy do it for him. Ginger had reported to the police weeks prior that David had threatened her life. Tracy Leach also testified that Ginger asked her, do you think David would have Tom kill me? Tracy also testified she heard that Tommy would carry a gun on him and that, quote, no one really knew Tom, but everyone thought he was weird. Now, for Tommy's trial, the prosecution completely switched their theories, and this case is a huge case involving a prosecution's use of inconsistent factual theories of a crime in successive trials. In Tommy's trial, they argued that Tommy acted alone and completely alone. At Tommy and David's jointed preliminary hearing, the prosecution relied on three jailhouse informants. They testified that Tommy told them that David wanted Ginger dead and hired him to help murder her and dispose of her body. They also said that Tommy had consensual sex. At the conclusion of the preliminary hearing, the judge claimed there was insufficient evidence to convict Tommy of the rape. After it was 
determined the co-dependents would be tried separately, the prosecution then trashed those informants and found two more informants for Tommy's trial. Most of the prosecution's case was based heavily on these two new found informants' testimony, one named Edward Fink along with John Del Freight. One of them was actually David's cellmate, and this was the sole connection between Tommy and the rape charges. Fink testified that while in prison, Tommy had confessed to them that he, quote, wanted to screw Ginger, but she refused his advances, so he had, quote, took it from her. They then said that Tommy killed Ginger, quote, not wanting any witnesses to the rape. The prosecution heavily denied that neither informant got any benefits for their testimony, but let's break it down. The prosecution first failed to present to the district court Fink's benefit receipts, nor did the district court press to ask for this information. There are records that Fink had been receiving benefits for 10 years while engaging in a pattern of providing needed information to the prosecution in return for favors. When Fink told authorities about Tommy's alleged confession, he was in prison at the time for a parole violation. At this time, within a two-month span, Fink was trying to obtain his release from custody and assistance at parole hearings by informing on two months more inmates before Tommy, claiming they had confessed to murder as well. Shortly after his testimony in Tommy's preliminary hearing, he was released from custody saying, quote, the parole board found my violation unfounded, not because of his much needed information about Tommy's rape allegations. After this, Fink was arrested for another parole violation and again testified against Tommy in the actual trial, claiming he only wished to serve his remaining days in prison. However, after Tommy was convicted, Fink did receive benefits from the prosecution, which he asked for prior. On August 30th, 1984, nine months after the conclusion of the trial, the prosecutor wrote to the Board of Prison Terms saying, quote, Fink's testimony was a crucial part of the people's case and urged him to be released before Christmas. The prosecutor also testified on Fink's behalf in his 1984 parole revocation hearing. Since the prosecutor didn't give the district court Fink's benefit receipts, the prosecutor was able to argue that Fink asked for no benefits and would receive nothing for his testimony and that he had no grounds to lie about Tommy's confession. Without the evidence to argue to the contrary, the defense could not factually disagree and dispute Fink's credibility. Now, let's call to the stand John Dal Freight, the second jailhouse informant. Freight testified at the trial something very similar to Fink's testimony. He said that Tommy told him he raped a woman named Ginger and killed her after she threatened to report it to the police. Freight then explained that Tommy stabbed Ginger in the neck, chest, and upper torso in addition to the head. Freight continued to say that the body was then placed, quote, in a shallow grave. Now, mind you, Ginger was only stabbed five times in the head, which killed her. In fact, the only place that the neck, chest, and upper torso was wrongly informed to the public was through newspaper articles. The exact quote, in a shallow grave was found in newspaper articles as well that are provided inside the prison for inmates. Freight had a long history as a police informant and had bad reputation for dishonesty. He lied to the courts about his informant work and the extent of his criminal history. Again, since the prosecution never gave forth evidence to the contrary that was available, the defense couldn't argue the testimony and the prosecutors were able to get away with Freight lying about his history. They even proclaimed that Freight, quote, hasn't been an informant before. The prosecutor also tried to vigorously exclude the importance of the witness testimony by the defense. Now, if you remember, Tommy's trial was first, but we started talking about David's trial first. Also remember that I mentioned in David's trial that they called two witnesses who said David had the motive. Well, these defense witnesses that testified in defense of Tommy were the same witnesses the prosecution served with subpoenas to appear here as prosecution witnesses in David's trial. They're the same witnesses testifying to the same exact thing in different trials for different theories. Holy shit. Now, let's talk about forensics. The medical examiner, Dr. Richards, testified that there was bruises on Ginger's hands, wrist, left elbow, and ankles, which were caused by application of force and heavy handling immediately prior to her death, which suggested that she had been restrained and raped. Richards then admitted that there was, quote, no anatomical evidence of rape, 
in the sense of vaginal injury and continued that there is no vaginal injury in most rape cases and that bruising to other parts of the body are a more certain indicator of rape. A sheriff's deputy, Mr. Coder, testified that the injury to Ginger's right wrist had been caused by a handcuff, which bolstered the theory since at one time, Tommy had owned a pair of handcuffs. I mean, like, who doesn't own a pair of handcuffs? Like, wink, wink, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. The prosecution then relied heavily on this testimony, urging that Ginger was bound and raped before being stabbed. He repeated Dr. Richard's testimony that, quote, bruises to the other parts of the body, to the wrist, to the angles, such as we have here, are more important than the absence of vaginal bruising in determining what happened to the victim. After this, the jury was instructed by the trial court to consider the, quote, presence of bruising and contusions to the wrist, hands, and ankles, and a cut on her wrist as evidence of rape. However, as the court found the evidence that a rape had occurred was not substantial and may not have been credible. This was surely open to attack. The defense argued in trial that Dr. Richard's testimony about the numerous injuries to the wrist, ankles, and hands close to or at the time of Ginger's death was not true. Dr. Richard's autopsy documents showed that there was no injury to Ginger's legs and there was one single injury to each of the arms that couldn't be determined if they happened before or after her death. In Dr. Richard's own words in the autopsy report, quote, remarkably little in the way of trauma to the body. And regarding the handcuff injury on Ginger's right wrist, the pathologist testified that was inconsistent with a handcuff injury, which rebutted the opinion of Deputy Coder. And finally, Ginger was found wearing her jeans that were zipped up, belted, but unbuttoned. There was expert testimony that said if Ginger had engaged in intercourse and she or someone else had then put her jeans on before washing or douching, then there would have been semen drainage in her jeans. None was found by the criminologist suggesting that she washed up after. This is consistent with consensual sex and inconsistent with the prosecution's allegations of rape. With all of this, the jury deliberated, and on November 4th, 1983, they convicted Tommy of first-degree murder and the forcible rape of Ginger Fleishy, and he was sentenced to death. He was then put in San Quentin Penitentiary. After filing many unsuccessful habeas corpus petitions with the California Supreme Court, Tommy was finally granted habeas relief as to his rape conviction. Richard A. Gadbois Jr., the United States District Judge who was appointed by President Reagan, presided over a three-day evidentiary hearing during Mr. Thompson's federal habeas proceedings. He vacated the rape conviction and rape special circumstance finding as well as the death penalty. Finding Tommy's constitutional right to effective assistance of counsel had been violated, he stated, quote, while the court found that the petitioner's remaining claims do not rise to the level of constitutional error, many of them nevertheless leave the court with an unsettling feeling. The disparate convictions and sentences of Thompson and Leach, for example, while legally permissible, are troubling to this court, given the intensity of public perceptions in this case and the defiancy of certainty regarding relative culpabilities. These concerns should be carefully considered by the state when deciding if society would be best served by retrying these cases, now almost 14 years old. Along with this, the court also heard that David Leach testified to his defense attorneys in 1982 that he walked in on Tommy and Ginger having consensual sex that he witnessed. David then testified to the same fact again to the Orange County District Attorney's Office at his 1995 parole hearing a year later. The jury nor the court had any chance to hear this evidence during the trial because these these facts were withheld from Tommy's defense attorneys, which puts forth a strong case that Tommy's constitutional rights to effective assistance of counsel had been violated. Having reviewed the new yet old evidence upon the evidentiary hearing, two jurors who voted to sentence Mr. Thompson to death now believe his sentence should be reduced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. Seven former prosecutors all urged the United States Supreme Court to grant a writ of certiorari in the case of Thomas Thompson. This is a request that the Supreme Court orders a lower court to send up the record
record of the case for review. The court usually is not under any obligation to hear these cases, and it usually only does so if the case could have national significance, might harmonize conflicting decisions in the federal circuit courts, and or could have precedential value. In fact, the court only accepts 100 to 150 of more than 7,000 cases that it is asked to review every year. These prosecutors believe that, quote, there are many disturbing aspects to the convictions and death sentence rendered and upheld in Thompson's case that leave us with little confidence that the death penalty is appropriate in this case. The prosecutors still, quote, believe in the imposition of the death penalty in an appropriate case where the death sentence is the product of fair and reliable proceedings. These prosecutors did not believe this case produced a fair or even a reliable result. So with all this new info, the court reversed Tommy's death sentence. However, a unanimous three-judge decision was made by the panel of the Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit to reverse the district court's decision to pardon Tommy's death sentence and reinstated his death sentence. The Court of Appeals panel also noted the strong rape evidence presented by the state and that Tommy couldn't demonstrate prejudice under prevailing legal standard, even if the court accepted his ineffective assistance of counsel argument. They then denied Tommy's petition for a rehearing, and on June 11, 1997, the Court of Appeals issued a mandate to deny all habeas relief petitions in Tommy's case. Another habeas petition was filed, but it ultimately failed two days before Tommy's scheduled execution date. The court noted the June 1997 mandate to deny these appeals, which they did. Shortly after this, the United States Supreme Court denied Tommy's petition for certiorari. The state appealed the Supreme Court's decision, calling the Court of Appeals' actions a grave abuse of discretion. After this, the governor of California, Pete Wilson, conducted the final clemency review. The clemency petition contained all the information and messed up shit I already told you about. All this new evidence, the former prosecution's opinions that this was a disturbing case, and all of it. It also stated the state of California can't perform an intracase proportionality review to review if the penalty imposed in a particular capital case is disproportionate to the penalty imposed in other cases. Tommy's defense said that this can only be achieved within the clemency process, continuing that it was fundamentally unfair that one defendant be escorted into the death chamber whilst the other defendant is eligible for parole. They brought up that the district attorney who prosecuted Tommy and the judge who presided over the case both admitted they had no clue what Tommy's actual participation in the murder was, and they both admitted also that Tommy had zero motivation to do either either the rape or the murder. The clemency petition continues that in granting clemency in capital cases, California governors have cited and relied on a number of factors, each of these factors being present in Mr. Tommy's case. Affirmative aspects of inmates' background, character, or history suggesting the aberrational nature of the offense as an event in the inmate's life, or the inmate's capacity for rehabilitation, or otherwise suggesting the appropriateness of granting mercy to the inmate, including a. Lack of prior criminal record, B, no prior history of violence, C, honorable service in the armed forces, D, a good work record, and E, educational accomplishment. Tommy checks all of these boxes. In fact, out of seven capital cases in the state of California that involved a special rape circumstance, Tommy was the only one who had zero criminal history prior to the offense. All the other six did. They also noted that Tommy adjusted very well to life in prison. One corrections officer, Scott Powell said that Tommy prevented the murder of another officer. When Tommy found out about the planned hit, he informed the prison and halted the potential murder. Powell also stated that Tommy was well-liked. He worked hard, even being put in the worst of the worst working environments and never complained. He said that Tommy would make him coffee and Powell would share a cold Coca-Cola. Tommy always gave the metal can back. He also noted Tommy worked in the armed service and was involved in veterans' activities at San Quentin, noting he had deep respect for the military. Another officer, Scott Hickson, stated that Tommy was the best worker and that without snitching, he would also let Hickson know when trouble was brewing. He also noted how artistic Tommy was and that he was the best painter in the row. Tommy had never been given a write-up and had a first-name basis with all the officers and inmates, including Hickson, who said, quote, he is the only inmate I allow to call me by my first name. Hickson and Tommy developed a strong bond over the three 
three years together, and quote, he is the only inmate behind bars I would trust with my life. Even with all of this, the clemency petition was denied. And on July 13th, 1998, Tommy ate his last meal consisting of Alaskan king crab legs with melted butter, Mandarin-style spare ribs, pork fried rice, a spinach salad, a hot fudge sundae, and a six-pack of Coca-Cola. At 11.48 p.m., Tommy was taken to the execution chamber and the IV was placed in his arm. The chamber doors were shut at 11.54. At 11.58, the media witnesses were led into the showing room and at midnight, the curtains opened. At 12.01 a.m., the lethal injection began, and at 12.06, on July 14, 1998, Thomas Martin Thompson, age 43, was pronounced dead, almost 17 years after the murder of Ginger Fleishy. After his death, the warden Art Calderon read Tommy's last words, saying, quote, For 17 years, the AG has been pursuing the wrong man. In time, he will come to know this. I don't want anyone to avenge my death. Instead, I want you to stop killing people. God bless. And with that, his sentence was served. All right, and that is the case about Tommy Thompson. Now, my opinions on this are very cut and dry. I don't think he should have been put to death. I don't think he raped Ginger. I think it was consensual, and then David came in at some point, and David did it. Whether Thompson was there during the murder, helped with the murder, whatever, he did not rape her, and that was the aggravating circumstance that got him the death penalty. It points more to David with most of the stuff. Everything just points him being the main aggravator in this whole thing was David, not Thompson. That's really all I'm gonna say about this case. I really don't have any other thoughts on it, but that's about it. Let's uh, let's eat this meal. This looks so delicious. Move this stuff here. There we go. Let's do this. All right, and also, I snuck some ranch dressing into the la into this last meal also. Not sure what dressing he had. I'm gonna make new recipes with a bunch of different salad dressings. For this one, it wasn't specified. I'm going with ranch, because that's my favorite. I'm gonna try these ribs, because these looked Great. They're just like fall apart. Mm. That's really good. Got that nice, sweet, salty, like this Chinese style. I used this, the uh, pork, also in the rice, so you don't have to make a second pork. Super easy. You can just cook it right into the rice, which we're going to try right now. Pretty on good. Moving on to the kings. Now, I broke the crab crackers literally during filming. So, I don't know what I'm gonna do. These things are spiky as shit. We're just gonna go for it. Do this, dip it in some butter. Mmm, baby, Look at that. Oh yeah. Mmm, oh yeah. That's good. We can't forget our Coke. A little drinky drink. <sighs> oh, yeah. Coke's better than Pepsi. Yep, it's true. Let's do the salad. Something light now. Got some of those homemade croutons. These are the best things ever. Just gotta do it. And there it is. Moment of truth. The finale, the ice cream sundae. This looks delicious. Mmm, look at that. Well, it's pretty good. Um, it's not as good as my custard-based ice cream, though. Um, again, it's three ingredients. It's hard to screw up. It's quick. It's easy. You don't have to have a machine. But yes, the custard-based one, if you have a little more time to make it, make that one. That one's so much better. And there we go. This was such a delicious meal. Very Asian-inspired. I love cooking Asian. I love eating Asian. It was great. And you can find this recipe at lastsupperpodcast.com slash blog. All right, and that concludes this episode of The Last Supper. Wherever you're watching or listening, make sure you follow me or subscribe. And on most platforms, you can get me upwards of a five-star review. I'd really appreciate, appreciate that. Get the show up the charts. Um, also, tell your friends, tell your family. That's the best way to spread the show. If you're on YouTube, I recommend you watch this video. I think you'll really like that one. And until then, make sure you enjoy every meal because you never know when it'll be your last.